What you got there, bud? Yeah. Three, two, one. <laughs> You've been lied to, but here's the scary part. It's not gonna stop. You see it every day on social media. Your friend just became a vegan and they start proselytizing about how great this diet is and how well they're doing on it and how if you don't change your ways right now, somehow the planet is gonna end in two years. The reason that we created it is because we wanted to address the greatest environmental threat that humans have ever faced. You know, a quick Google search will let you know that the vegan diet is now everywhere. I just don't want to contribute to the exploitation and the suffering and the murder of all these innocent animals anymore. Listen, when I was a kid, we goofed on this whole idea of veganism. It's not a sustainable diet. 80% of people who go on vegan diets stop the diet within three months. We're getting all these people talking about the vegan diet as if it's the best way to eat. I always try to you know, tap into something that's going to better me, whether as an athlete, as a parent, as a person. Uh, I'm vegan now. Oh. OK, well, let's look at it. Eating french fries, vegan. Pasta, vegan. Sugar, vegan. So this is unhealthy vegan food right here. This one you're about to have is called the Mac Daddy. Are you telling me vegan people eat the same stuff as we do? <laughs> okay, so no one in their right mind would ever consider the foods I just mentioned as being healthy. There are a lot of great foods you can eat on a vegan diet. Broccoli comes to mind. So does kale, if you want to actually eat kale. Your basic carnivore or meat eater will say, a vegan diet can't possibly be healthy. How could it? You can't get all the vitamins by not eating meat. The big one that everyone likes to throw around is B12. Vegans would say not true. You could just take a multi-cap every day and get all the vitamins you need. That would be great. Vitamin B12, a nutrient largely absent in plants, was not available in exogenous vitamin form until 1947. We didn't even learn how to extract vitamins until the early 1900s. So it was impossible to be a vegan, say, in the 1800s or any time in history before that. Let's just take the amino acids, the fats, from another source and recreate those so that we're taking the animal entirely out of the equation. So let's say you go on a vegan diet and you're eating your fake meat. Here's a list of everything you would have to take in supplements just to make it a well-rounded, healthy diet. Vitamin B12, iron, calcium, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, and protein. Now you might be saying some of these fake meats do have some of these vitamins. Well, yes, the Beyond Burger has less than 1% of a few of them and claims to have protein. But it turns out that plant protein is not digested as effectively as it is from meat. So you're not actually using that protein as effectively, but we'll get to that later. It doesn't matter what the truth is because pop culture is into this. There's a responsibility uh, for me to try and teach and show other people what I've learned. We're hearing it from politicians. My veganism is a much better way to accord myself with, the, with my values. Do you support changing the dietary guidelines? The, the, yes. The, you know, the food pyramid. But people yes. Are like, yes. To reduce red meat specifically. Yes, I would. They're telling us that not only is eating a vegan diet okay, they're telling us it's the way we are meant to eat. I'm more active. I'm not as sluggish. It takes less water, less energy. And then there's the argument for sentient beings. No one wants to see an animal die so that we can live. What you got there, bud? Yeah. One of the arguments on the vegan side is, OK, yes, we are part of the food chain, but if we could manufacture something in order not to let sentient beings die, wouldn't that be better? Well. Yes, it would be better, but is that really actually the truth? Because you became vegan, because you're eating fake meat, does that mean a sentient being didn't die? Well, that's something we'll have to look at later. There's nothing acceptable about torturing, raping, and murdering a being that doesn't want to be killed. 
when you look at Beyond Meat or Impossible Burger, you're being sold a bill of goods. You're being told that, hey, this is better for you. It's way better than meat. The choice on the Burger King menu isn't between this and this, right? but between this and this. And in that case, it's a no-brainer. We made a point of making sure that the protein content and the protein quality, actually the protein quality of our burger is higher than the protein quality of beef from a cow. What is usually being offered is protein. We like to talk about protein. We like to talk about the protein transition and how animal protein is supposed to be bad and plant protein is to be, supposed to be superior, but that is extremely reductionist. This is Frederick Lacroix. He's a professor at Brussels University and he's a food scientist and technologist. A piece of meat or a piece of cheese or an egg is about much more than just protein. It contains a whole spectrum of vitamins and minerals, but also a lot of bioactive compounds that you will not find in um, the uh, imitation products. Protein from plants and protein from animals are not created equally. Animal proteins are complete proteins, which means they contain essential amino acids our muscles need to grow, repair, and function. They are also more digestible than plant proteins, making them easier to absorb. That is problematic because, uh, say, you know, vitamin B12 or other B vitamins that are naturally occurring in meat, many people cannot absorb those vitamins and minerals in their supplemental form. My name is Nina Teichels. I am a science journalist and author, and I'm the executive director of a nonprofit group called the Nutrition Coalition. You may think that you're getting vitamin B, but your body is not absorbing it well. And that's true for many people. You know, when you look at Impossible Burger and companies like that, they use a lot of uh, novel proteins. In other words, things in their meat that we really can't even fully understand. This is Dr. Tony Hampton, a board certified doctor in family medicine and obesity. And I'm really a big fan of teaching my patients to eat real food. So why would I you know, transition them to a diet where they're eating uh, artificially prepared food or processed food? And you have to start from material that is not all that suitable for that, basically. So you, you need lots of processing to get there. Nutrition is easy. It's easy to make something that outperforms, you know, meat from animals in terms of the nutritional profile. Intrinsically, those foods always end up being ultra-processed foods because that's the only way that you can try to get near the original. Biochemistry, it's molecular biology, it's genomics, genetics. There is a growing number of change makers out there Biophysics. who are making a difference. Okay. Think about the colors. It's material science. Flavors you supposed to have, you have to think about the mouthfeel, it's particularly difficult. The tech innovators who are changing how we think about food. I mean, I'll never stop liking steak. And the civil society leaders who are inspiring food movements everywhere and holding us accountable for our words and actions. What the fuck? Isn't this getting a little creepy? It's crazy because it really looks it like It does, it totally. Real. Why are these companies going out of their way to make a non-meat product look, taste, and smell exactly like meat? We could save our planet. Mm. We're supposed to eat meat. Our mission is to completely replace animals in the food system by 2035. So, and you laugh, but we are absolutely serious about it. It seems as though that the mission statement behind all of this is, hey, we're going to give you the taste of meat, but it's better for you and it's better for the planet. Steady livestock and herd sizes do not cause global warming at all. Oh, my God! You heard that right. All we hear about is methane from cows and how it's bringing on impending doom for the planet. Cows are the most destructive species and the most invasive species on Earth, except for possibly human. There is absolutely no scenario for preventing catastrophic climate change without a vast reduction in the scale of animal agriculture. Livestock, of course, in general, has a greater impact on climate than plants. Okay, that's just true in general. This is Frank Mitlerner, a professor and air quality specialist in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. Ruminant livestock produce a gas called methane. They belch that methane out, 
uh, the manure also produces methane and that methane is a potent greenhouse gas. That's part of the narrative and that narrative is the concerning part. The other truth is that methane does not stay in the atmosphere as long as CO2 does. When cars emit CO2 into the atmosphere, it stays up for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Methane, on the other hand, has a lifespan of about 10 years, which means... Which means that in the presence of steady cattle raising, methane is eliminated from the atmosphere as new methane is being sent into it. Which means that responsible farming and cattle raising emphatically does not cause global warming. This isn't to say that it can't in other parts of the world. India has more livestock than the United States, the European Union, and China combined. And they largely do not eat the cows. Mainly our goal is to save cows. So here's a conundrum. I see a lot of vegans saying that they want to stop eating cows. It's immoral. How do I morally justify doing these things to animals? Are my taste buds more important than their life? Well, India isn't eating the cows, so I guess the only way to stop this is to make cows extinct. Talk about a catch-22. We save our motherland. We save our our motherland. They save our our motherland. India alone accounts for up to 80% of the world's emissions associated with livestock. A country that does not eat cows is causing the most problem with emissions. Meat is actually quite simple at a high level. It's amino acids, it's lipids, it's trace minerals, and it's water. None of those are exclusive to the animal. What we're doing is taking those same constituent parts, amino acids, lipids, trace minerals, and water, and we're converting them directly into meat. And in doing so, we are eliminating agriculture's biggest bottleneck, the animal. There's a guy named Thanos, Uh and he is working on developing the power to snap his finger and wipe out half the population. What'd you do? Ah. If you had his gauntlet, would you do it for cows? I love cows. You do? But I don't love having billions of cows covering the entire planet. That's actually an interesting moral dilemma. I guess I probably would because those cows are not gonna end well anyway. Wow, I didn't think he would actually say it out loud. Okay, I'll give the guy a break. He sounded confused. Maybe he didn't understand the question. It's not like he'd say it again. If you could snap your fingers and just vaporize that industry, which I would do in a heartbeat if I could. (sighs) Do we have another fact? Two thirds of agricultural land in the world is called marginal land. This means the soil quality and water levels are not enough to grow crops. About three quarters of all the agricultural land in the world is used for livestock. We use the land for ruminant livestock. Ruminants are able to eat all the things we can't on marginal land, and thus they are using two thirds of all agricultural land, because we can't. The reason why ruminant animals uh, belch out methane is because of a unique ability they have to eat, to digest feeds that nobody else can. The remaining third is arable land, where you can grow crops for animals and for people. And just as a side note, if you eat organic food, then that organic food must only be fertilized with organic fertilizers. And they almost without exception stem from some animal's butt. It's not a big, beautiful, green field of cows having a good time. <laughs> it is a very binary discourse, I would say. So it is, it's almost a moral discourse with uh, two categories, good and evil. Meat is, you know, is the bad boy and the plants are the good ones. So you would end up with uh, slogans such as uh, cows are worse than cars or uh, to produce one, one, one steak you, you would have the equivalence of I don't know how many showers. The other big argument is about the cow's water footprint and how it's so massive. It's by far the biggest user of fresh water, by far the biggest polluter of fresh water of any industry on earth. This one surprisingly is laughably easy. 94% of a cow's water footprint is rainwater. Water that would be there with or without the existence of the cow. This means the cow's feed is grown almost completely by God above. And what happens to that rainwater? The cows piss it out and irrigate the land. 
People just want to do the right thing, right? The general consumer just wants what's healthy. It's lower in calories, lower in total fat, lower in saturated fat, and zero cholesterol. Let's go back to the 1980s. We were told that if you didn't eat fat, you couldn't possibly get fat. So we had all of these products come out. Snackwells was one of my favorites in that era. There was no fat in the product, so it was nothing but sugar and carbohydrates. If you didn't eat fat, they were claiming you couldn't get fat. Did you know that granola bar is loaded with no. fat? Oh, no. But here's Kellogg's low-fat granola bars, half the fat of the leading crunchy granola bar. Hey. Really good. So record scratch, you get to 2021 going into 2022, and the low fat, high sugar of the 80s didn't turn out the way we wanted it to. What happened? We have an obesity epidemic, particularly in the United States. America's obesity has not doubled, it's tripled in the past 50 years. The CDC defines obesity as anyone with a body mass index over 30. In the 1960s, that was only about 14% of our population, but today it's closer to 40%. So what do we do? I'm open to suggestions. A plant-based diet in general has more antioxidants, more beneficial nutrients. It's usually lower in saturated fat. So there are a number of different reasons why it's healthier. You know, I spend a lot of time every day in social media and the question becomes, well, come on, this has to be healthier for me. My doctor tells me not to eat meat. We have meatless Mondays in schools around the country. We have people in the government who are telling us that meat is bad and we should have a meat out day. A proclamation declaring March 20th meat out day in Colorado. Have you seen the lines in reference to people getting boxes of food and we, we won't have a day of no meat? It's not the first time the governor, whose partner is vegan, has snubbed the beef industry. Sonnenberg recalled how he plugged Burger King's meatless burger, sending a bunch to the Department of Agriculture. This contributes to his war on rural Colorado. It is indeed a slap in the face. And the reason for the proclamation is written below. They want to remove animal products from our diet because it reduces the risk of various ailments, including heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, various cancers, and diabetes. It becomes a lullaby. It becomes normal. You know, we're just putting them to sleep. Meat is bad. Meat is bad. Meat is bad. Eating a plant-based diet is better for our health, for weight, for heart disease, for cholesterol, for diabetes, for all kinds of different reasons. And doctors get lulled into this also because there's correlation. You know, too much meat is bad for your heart. Correlation does not equal causation. I get it. You're a doctor. You don't want to get sued. Someone has a heart attack. You told them to eat meat. Yet we don't sue them if someone had a heart attack and we told them to only eat vegetation, which by the way, you want to talk about correlation. A study out of the UK that followed people for 18 years found that while people who eat meat had a higher risk of heart attacks, vegetarians had a higher risk of stroke. So a new study suggests that vegetarians might have a higher risk of stroke compared to meat eaters. The research found vegetarians and vegans had a 20% higher risk of stroke than meat eaters. The exact reasons for the higher risk, not clear. It's possible that very low cholesterol levels and lower levels of nutrients could be the cause. So I say, eat a steak. If you are really trying to show causation, you're kind of forced at some point to take this model and say, I gotta still prove my point. So even if I start with an epidemiological study, which is more affordable, easier to do, I have to then go to the next stage. And until I get to the next stage, it's almost irresponsible to, to put out into the, the media that this study proves a certain thing when it really doesn't, because the interpretation of the study is gonna be what you put on the front line, you know, on the headline. Now we're being told that having a fake product is better than a natural product. And this is coming from the people who used to tell you natural is better. Now they're telling you that the fake stuff is better. All the legendary flavor, none of the meat. When the wagon of change comes, you ride along with it. I tell people all the time, eat foods that have exactly one ingredient. 
Steak is one ingredient. Broccoli is one ingredient. Dairy, one ingredient. You take Beyond Meat, you want to guess how many ingredients are in that? Well, here, let me run through them. Water, pea protein, expeller pressed canola oil, refined coconut oil, rice protein, natural flavors, cocoa butter, mung bean protein, methyl cellulose, potato starch, passion, apple extract, pomegranate extract, salt, potassium chloride, love, vinegar, lemon juice concentrate, sunflower lecithin, and beet juice extract for color. My favorite part is they're even adding fake blood. Well, guess what? The red stuff you see in your steak, that's not blood. That's myoglobin. And they're using heme as a substitute to fulfill hungry vegans' insatiable craving for the real thing. Hey, look, we're giving you blood in a more compassionate way. Because what they show is going to be the gastronomic culinary end product nicely put on a, in a bun and, and served uh, something that appeals to the senses. Plant-based sounds more innocent. It's uh, aiming not at the vegans, it's aiming at the public at large because the business model is not made for the niche of for vegans, it's made for um, what they call flexitarians. The only consumer we care about is, is an omnivore, a meat consumer. And the terminology is extremely important. They will not talk about a vegan sausage, for instance. They will call it a field-grown sausage or anything like that. That's why you will never actually find vegan as a denomination very explicitly on, on the label. And what we see today, remarkably, is that the, the vegan crusaders in particular, they are advocating for those products that are created by big corporations. So they're, they're taking sides with, um, with global elites and uh, investors and multinational companies, and they're proudly doing so. Whether you look at McDonald's or you look at Subway or Dunkin' or KFC, these tests that we're involved in, those are some of the largest names in food, and we're partnering with them to bring our products to the consumer. So we're excited about where we are. I think this evolution has to do with, of course, uh, what is allowed within a societal discourse. Now, any fringe movement or any radical idea will never, ever be able to dominate mainstream media if the powers that be don't allow it to do so. It can only flourish, it can only be if it is endorsed. It's here. It's here and it's in every burger king everywhere. Burger king. A lot of people are thinking fake meat is the way to go, that it's number one healthier for you and good for the planet. And in fact, the companies that are doing this, they're not interested in you at all or the planet. They're interested in their bottom line. The critical thing to investors is this is a, at the time, one and a half trillion dollar global market that's being served by a prehistoric technology that hasn't improved in millennia and is demonstrably one of the least effic efficient technologies on Earth, um, it kind of reads to them as, oh, okay, actually, this is worth putting some money into. In 2019, Impossible Foods raised another $300 million to ramp up production. From the likes of Google Ventures, Bill Gates, and a slew of entertainment celebrities. Somebody made Banana peel, pulled pork, and it just took the internet by a storm. Holy frick. The texture tastes exactly like pulled pork. The flavor, 100% like a barbecue pulled pork. I'm so confused. Vegans will say only eat vegetables. Meat eaters will say only eat meat. But somehow when you put them both together, that's a bad idea. Listen, we've been talking about this for 40 years, and we've done nothing except get fatter and sicker. So that ends now. We're going to talk about this in a very blunt way. You may get upset, but that's not what I'm worried about here. I'm worried about your health. So here's why eating meat and green vegetables alone is healthy. When you cut most carbs and all sugars and grains, your body's inflammation starts going down. Also, your body burns carbs and sugar first and then fat. But when you cut most carbs and all sugars and grains, your body becomes fat adapted and burns fat as its first fuel source. Which means even when you're not eating, your body is using the fat that's already on you to burn for energy. Go out and get some sun and move on top of that and you're getting your essential vitamins and minerals and you're good to go.
So if anyone says this movie does not have a direct explanation of why meat and veggies are a complete healthy meal, just give them the timestamp. I always like to take snapshots from history. If you go back to Woodstock, which was in 1968, you couldn't find the fat person in that crowd. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of these people were ripped as if they had been doing sit-ups all day long, yet they were swilling beer. We didn't have a fat problem in this country. Compare that to even 22 years ago with Woodstock 99, and well, that tells me we have a problem. Media will say, hey, we're fat, we're out of shape, we're dying, but it doesn't offer any solution. Why is that? Why doesn't the media go any further? Well, they're moving on. They're in the business of telling a salacious story and then moving on. You know, it's all about sound bites. We don't ever do anything about it. For many years as a physician, I was a vegetarian for eight years. And, and what I found is that as I've attempted to encourage that dietary approach in that community that I serve, what I found is that they struggled to do it because of various reasons. Some was culture. Uh, some people felt like if I eat that way, which is considered healthy, that was uh, anti my culture, not just anti my diet. So it, it was almost like you're taking away a part of me. And a lot of people in the community, that's really offensive to them. So let's listen to your body. And if you eat a certain way and you do really well, why not just eat that diet? I mean, I have patients who are carnivore and if they eat, uh, you know, certain types of grains because of the things like oxalates and phytates and those anti-nutrients, lectins, when they eat these things, they just get sick. So how, how would I look as a physician to stand before them and say, you know what, I know you get sick from this stuff. You'll be fine after a while. Your body will get used to it and just stay sick until you get used to it. That doesn't make any sense. Now, all that being said, you won't be seeing any interviews with any vegans in this movie. That's not without trying. We asked them, specifically vegan experts and doctors. We asked maybe the first and foremost expert everyone talks about, Dean Ornish. Fat tends to cause you to be fat. We asked Dr. John McDougall. Kempner knew back in the 50s that sugar makes insulin work better and cures diabetics. We asked everybody's favorite, Dr. Michael Greger. Nip the tip. Uh-huh, and then you suck it all up. Mm. And we asked the esteemed doctor at Harvard, Walter Willett. In the U.S., red meat consumption is actually down about 40% from the peak in 1970. Uh, it needs to go down further. Uh, even with sort of moderate efforts, we can make big dietary changes. Now, you may be surprised by the responses. Or maybe you're not. <laughs> I don't know. Let's read the letter I sent them. Dear Doctor, I am about to go into production on a documentary about the ongoing debate regarding the vegan, plant-based diet's health benefits. My goal is to host an intelligent discussion between highly regarded experts, which provides the viewer with enough information to make well-informed dietary decisions. Given your expertise on the subject, I'd like to extend to you an invitation to participate. While we have not often found ourselves in agreement on the topic, I believe that there is enough common ground in our efforts to help people be healthy for us to make a fascinating and informative documentary. During your interview, I will give you a fair chance to speak your mind on areas in which we both agree and disagree. I want to feature you in the film in your own words, presenting your arguments for the diet that you believe is optimal. To make this as easy as possible, we will conduct the interview views online, remotely, and at your convenience. I very much hope that you will join me in this endeavor, and I look forward to hearing from you. With best wishes, Vinnie Torterich. Pretty good, right? Okay, I'll get this out of the way. Dean Ornish just flat out didn't respond, and Walter Willett said, Due to the deluge of emails, I regrettably am not able to respond to all of them. Our students, postdocs, and faculty members will remain top priorities. Please consider whether an email is necessary before sending. I had heard that in high school, Dr. Willett's nickname was Sassy, because I always thought that he had an affinity for the cat in Homeward Bound. <coughs> Sassy. Sassy. My boys! My boys! Sassy. Then there's Dr. John McDougall. We sent him the same exact letter, and shockingly, he wrote back. 
He wanted to know who was financing the documentary and who would be in the documentary. Fair questions, to which we said, It is being financed by Fat Squirrel Films. Potential guests, Michael Greger, Lier Keith, Nina Teicholz, Frederick Leroy, and hosted by Vinnie Tortorich. Sounds like something I should contribute to. Keep me informed. I was completely shocked that he was going to do this, but I thought this must be too good to be true. Would you be available May 27th at 4 p.m. ET for an interview for the previous mentioned film? I am available for a Zoom interview. Maybe I was wrong. Vinny and his producing team will send you a DocuSign release form before your interview and the Zoom link. And then he said, Likely I will not sign any release agreements, so don't waste our time if this is required. Oh, and then he gave us another by the way. By the way, how are you going to include Nina Teicholz, a conspiracy theorist who bashes current science with a pile of untruths, and Frederic Leroy, the president of the Belgian Association for Meat Science and Technology? This does not sound like anything but an invitation for controversy that sends the debate about proper human nutrition south. Are you sure you want me in your documentary? We have asked every leader of the vegan community and have zero takers. I have to decline. Please extend my apologies for having to cancel at this late date. Signing the release is unacceptable. I live a life uh, that is uh, dominated by the correct information. If I'm being completely honest, I sort of expected these responses. And there's more later, but the clear thing to me is, it doesn't matter how nice your letter is, they don't want to debate. These guys do interviews all the time and say things like, a healthy and sustainable diet uh, is a dietary pattern characterized by unsaturated fats, largely plant-based proteins, whole grains, abundant fruits and vegetables. And things like, There's all sorts of ways you can get people to lose weight. Tuberculosis, a cocaine habit, AIDS, chemotherapy, lots right. of ways to lose weight. So they're not afraid to do interviews, just as long as you don't, you know, Ask them real questions. So keep rocking. <laughs> While I'm fine doing this only with those who do agree with me, I still want to take a look at some of these claims these people are making. So let's have at it. The reason I've spent 40 years conducting the highest quality research published in the leading peer-reviewed journals is that's really the whole point of science, is to help people sort out what's true and what isn't. A whole foods plant-based diet that's low in fat and sugar, moderate exercise, various stress management techniques, including meditation, and psychosocial this is support Dean or Ornish. love and intimacy. His claim to fame, besides and being and associated with Bill Clinton and the low-fat movement, is a lifestyle study he did that claims to show plant-based diets reverse heart disease. So you have done studies on people who have reversed chronic heart disease. We found that even severe heart disease can be reversed. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high yeah. cholesterol, that even early stage prostate cancer may be slowed, stopped, and even reversed. The problem with the study is the same as the rest. Correlation versus causation. The people in the study who reversed heart disease with a plant-based diet also exercised and meditated and focused on well-being overall. Oh, and they cut sugar. I've talked about this before, but cutting sugar and sticking to real food plus exercise is going to work for anybody at first, regardless of what food they're choosing. But as we talked about before, the vitamin issue can't be avoided. Red meat has significant benefits. It's nutrients for much of the world. Heart disease and its causes are so varied that you can't just say, eat this, don't eat that. The reason a lot of studies show that red meat causes heart disease is because those who smoke and drink are more likely to eat red meat. If you're vegan or plant-based, you're automatically more concerned with your health and therefore more likely to exercise as well. What about cancer? World Health Organization says eating processed meat poses the same cancer risk as smoking. The report puts processed meat, such as bacon and hot dogs, at the highest risk rating. That is the same as cigarettes and alcohol. Red meat is called the next highest risk. In the nutritional field, um, they will typically also associate red meat and processed meats. So they make it very often one category, and then they say, you know, Red meats and processed meats are associated with colorectal cancer and with all sorts of cardiometabolic diseases. And probably some of those products aren't all that healthy for you. Um, but it is a extremely heterogeneous category. Well, in general, if you wanted to pick some food item in a negative way, then 
uh, the oldest technique and strategy uh, in the books is really that you look at the worst offenders. Even processed meats, the concept of processed meat, processed meats, it involves the worst of products. All, you know, the, 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 all the deep fried nuggets and whatever's, um, whatever's on the market now. Whenever they do the studies, they mix red meat, good wholesome steaks, in with you know, things like salami, hamburgers, and we don't even know if they're taking the ketchup and all the goop off of the hamburger. They're talking about a hamburger from a hamburger joint. All of this gets lumped in, so they're not just talking about the one single food, they're talking about all of it at the same time. Everybody from the World Health Organization to the American Cancer Society has said, don't eat so much processed meats, don't eat so much red meat. They don't like to differentiate. They all want to lump it together with the worst of imaginable, uh, imaginable products. Processed meats, why are they bad? Well, in order to get a meat to have shelf life, they have to add stuff to it, chemicals. They have to add sugar in the form of dextrose. So in essence, we're lumping in processed meats and what you might get, say, at a McDonald's or a fast food restaurant with real red meat, steak, ground chuck, real hamburgers that you may have at home, but it's all lumped together. Then they throw it out and say that it's cancer causing. Those studies repeated again and again and again, multiple times over the course of a year, penetrate the consciousness of um, the population. They're picked up by the media. They're reported as if they are causal findings, as if they're cause and effect when they're not. In order to show cause and effect, you have to do a clinical trial. And so, when you look at the clinical trials on red meat, what has been found in the meta-analyses that's when they do a review of all the clinical trials is they cannot find that red meat causes any of these diseases. Based on the research, we cannot say with any certainty that eating red or processed meat causes cancer, diabetes, or heart disease. The study recommends adults continue current red and processed meat consumption. It's a finding that's prompted calls for a retraction. The most prominent critic, Harvard School of Public Health, which labeled that conclusion irresponsible and unethical. Until you have those clinical trials, you cannot convict meat of causing these diseases. It's just, we do not have the level of scientific evidence that is needed to do that. So you might ask yourself, why aren't more studies done? Well, studies cost a lot of money, a lot of money. And who has money to do that? Big corporations, the ones that want to see meat go away so that you can buy their fake foods. These are confusing times, which is just about the right time to have the Burger King Impossible Whopper, a Whopper made without beef that tastes just like a whopper. So what is happening is that they're turning the original notions we had about food upside down. Um, and what was, what was cherished the most in the past by the previous generations were the nutrient-dense foods. And that, of course, included meat and dairy and animal source foods that were essential for food security before. And suddenly those products have become the ones that we should avoid, which is extremely surprising. Um, you even see that meat, red meat in particular, is often called an unhealthy food and they, they lump it together with sugar and with um, refined, uh, refined starches. So that is a very remarkable evolution. So the reality is the world's best diets from a vast array of evidence, and, and this is what the True Health Initiative experts from all around the world rally around. There, there's a theme there, and the basic theme, Michael Pollan said it nicely, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So in essence, we've never really had a study done in the opposite direction, or have we? There's one going on online right now. It's a bunch of in one experiments of people cutting out sugars and grains, eating low carb, eating nothing but meat and vegetables, and it's an amazing thing what's happening. They're losing weight. They're reversing type 2 diabetes. They're reversing their A1Cs. These are real people and real things. And I guess you're going to say, well, an M1 experiment is just one person. But when that experiment happens over and over and over again, not 100 times, not 1,000 times, not 10,000 times, but hundreds of thousands of times, isn't that basically 
an epidemiological study? Epidemiological studies are exactly how they figured out the other side of this equation. So if it works on that end, it has to work on the opposite end. Follow the science. What you'll hear very often is that they tell you to follow the science. And we see that academia, a part of academia, maybe a, the loudest part of, of academia, is um, following that narrative and pushing that narrative. Eco-anxiety is a condition that people are reporting, and it refers to the dread and helplessness that come with watching the impacts of climate change. Climate change is exploiting the world's land at an unprecedented rate. Eating more plant-based foods and sustainably produced meats can change land use and mitigate climate change. Making conscious food choices is a place where a lot of ground can be made up by individuals. Would you like to try a burger made with plants? Plants. It's delicious, and I am a kid, so if I like it... Mm, mm, mm. Companies trying to sell plant-based foods make sense because it's a new market with lots of money to be made. But this isn't just companies per se. It's a group of people from all over the world pushing a new way of eating that may ultimately disturb you. First, there's Eat Lancet. Eat Lancet is pushing an agenda right now that's called the Planetary Health Diet. That's creepy. A new diet that some scientists say could be the key to sustainability. New research published in the medical journal The Lancet claims that the planetary health diet will not only prevent further damage to the environment, but will also improve our health. One of the main examples is probably the planetary health diet, which is, uh, has been developed by the Eat Lancet Commission. There's a group called Eat Lancet, and they do a lot of these studies. Well, when you go to their website, what they claim is, we're basing all of this on sound science, inpatient disruption, and novel partnerships. They also say, However, the scale of change to the food system is unlikely to be successful if left to the individual or the whim of consumer choice. This change requires reframing at the population and systemic levels. By contrast, Hard policy interventions include laws, fiscal measures, subsidies, and penalties, trade reconfiguration, and other economic and structural measures. Countries and authorities should not restrict themselves to narrow measures or soft interventions. Too often, policy lands at the soft end of the policy ladder. The Eat Lancet diet has been designed based on health arguments. so. It's not a diet that has been designed for um, the environmental part. The environmental parts come later. First, they designed it for health. And the person that is the architect of the planetary health diet is mostly Walter Willett from Harvard. Now we have large long-term epidemiologic studies where we've followed uh, hundreds of thousands of people for decades. And again, we see compared to plant-based protein sources, uh, red meat is related to higher risks of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mm. uh, some cancers, uh, and overall mortality. So uh, you put all that together, and the weight of evidence is actually extremely strong. Walter Willett has been saying since the early 1990s that the correct amount of meat to eat is nearly zero, that we should eat very, very little meat. He doesn't believe in it. And he's been saying this since the early 90s. He also runs a very influential program at Harvard, the Harvard School of Public Health, which he ran for decades. He also published papers, 78 papers, according to one analysis that we did, uh, where the findings were that red meat was associated with negative health outcomes. And 130 findings that vegetarian or mostly vegetarian diets were associated with positive outcomes. Our study on the Harvard School of Public Health found hundreds of thousands of dollars given to it by the nut industry, um, source of protein that's that's an alternative to meat. Uh, we found funding from um, groups that believe in veganism, such as you know who, that have an ideological or religious belief in in veganism. None of which are ever declared by Walter Willett when he uh, issues a paper. He always says that he has no conflicts of interest. And yet there is this huge amount of funding for the school in general. Now, Eat Lancet successfully 
came to dominate at the United Nations with its planetary diet, its global reference diet, whatever you want to call it, without having a single conference or meeting that included views to the contrary. So that's a stunning fact. The UN, with all its member states and agencies, obviously have a critical role to play in this great food transformation ahead. And you have the power to set the agenda and create the arenas to make sure that food becomes a driving force for progress, for people, planets, and prosperity for all. Without any debate or consideration from opposing sides, reach a consensus about where the whole planet ought to go in terms of nutrition. So I could not be more proud to introduce co-chair Professor Walter Willett from Harvard School of Public Health to present the key findings of the Eat Lancet landmark report on food planet health. It is important to investigate, to examine every detail in wonder. We're not here to do things by the book. Ask around, please do. Define a healthy reference diet. A question is like a journey. Define planetary boundaries. A quest. Global food system modeling framework. Nothing important will ever happen as long as you don't dare to ask. We do have strong data to support moving down the pathway toward achieving these goals. Free, open, question, question everything. everything. We do, we do see that feeding 10 billion people a year a healthy diet can stay within uh, planetary boundaries. It really is possible. Uh, and we can have the opportunity of passing on to the, uh, our children a healthy planet. Thank you. This is a group that wants to change the global food system. I'm not really sure what that means. You're going to tell me that a Cajun in Louisiana is going to eat the same thing that someone in the Maasai tribe in Africa is going to eat? Or even a guy up in Reykjavik, Iceland? How do you bring the world together to eat the same food or to think the same way? It's not natural. It's never been done. And I doubt it's going to get done here. But what we're going to end up with is a big mess along the way. <laughs> Eat Lancet does say you can have beef, but how much? Well, I looked into it. It's seven grams per day. You want to know how much seven grams is? This chunk of cheese is seven grams. This is what Eat Lancet wants you to have per day in beef. I did more math. This amount of cheese could feed a family of four. This year is seven grams of jerky, beef jerky, okay? Um, if anybody thinks that that's enough for an adult uh, person to consume, uh, that person either doesn't understand nutrition or doesn't understand human culture or human nature. This is just simply laughable. Uh, yes, you can do very uh, well without uh any animal products. I do mention, though, keeping an eye on the B12 issue is important. Uh, some people uh, not paying attention uh, end up with very uh, major neurologic disease because of that. But there's a simple fix uh, of, uh, by taking supplements or fortified food for the B12 part of it. Walter Willett, he says he's going to tell us what to think. The scale of change to the food system is unlikely to be successful if left to the individual or the whim of... Yeah, yeah, you remember the quote. Willett had a hand in writing that, along with all the other good folks at Eat Lancet. This essentially means this unelected body of people are pushing to get policy passed that will raise the price of meat in a variety of different ways, while pushing a diet not based on evidence or how people behave. We also need to deal with policy and use economic levers, uh, taxes and subsidies to make it uh, the uh, a viable choice for everybody along the food chain. They will actually have to force us to do what they want us to do in order to comply with their global eating plan. This work done by Eat Lancet is really the pathway forward. It's the compass. And the people who've produced it are very courageous. 
They're going to come under attack, and they will continue to come under attack, but it's important. And that's because the future of people and the planet depend on it. The Planetary Health Diet is a global reference diet for adults that is symbolically represented by half a plate of fruits, vegetables, and nuts. The other half consists of primarily whole grains, plant protein, beans, lentils, pulses, unsaturated plant oils, modest amounts of meat and dairy, and some added sugars and starchy vegetables. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a recipe for getting fat. If you look at the actual grams that they propose for these carbs, they recommend eating almost two and a half pounds of carb-heavy foods every day. But my God, stay away from meat. All you have to do is follow the money. It turns out that Eat Lancet's Planetary Health Diet is in partnership with the World Economic Forum. We will now start a quite a high number of task forces to look at all the different issues. What do we need to do in the next year to improve the financing situation for global food system transformation? What, what can we all do to help? Actually, I just mentioned that, that my donor have actually committed uh, last year, uh, last month here in Stockholm, actually four billion, and out of four, four billion, billion mm -hmm. that okay. actually half billion is dedicated to food system. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a major, major victory that we should mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. congratulate ourselves. Are they really interested in the ethics of this whole thing? Do they really care about the environment or our health, or is this just purely economical on their part? I hate all human beings. All humans are a psychotic scourge to this planet. You know what the animals would say to you if they could speak? Don't fucking kill me! Where'd my tooth go? Did I just fucking break my tooth? A vegan fried egg. And 100% the only guilt-free option you're going to have for Thanksgiving. To be sure, there are people who believe what they're saying, but a lot of the time, they don't come with any other evidence as to why other than don't. Once you see the science, I think you will agree that you're glad you were not on a ketogenic diet. Okay, bottom line is um, do not eat a ketogenic diet. Meanwhile, very powerful people are doing their thing behind the scenes to make sure their agendas get passed and we're just letting it happen. It's pervaded everything too. Not just the dark, but somehow brazenly public corners of the political world. I was watching one of these vegan propaganda documentaries. It was about changing the game or something where they take athletes. And they're saying, hey, these are the best athletes in the world because they only eat a vegan diet and they never touch red meat. And then they go into some of these athletes. Well, one guy they claimed was, well, one of the strongest people in the world. Patrick is one of the strongest men on the planet with multiple world records, including the front hold, the keg lift, and the log lift. Which is odd because I like watching those competitions and I had never seen this guy show up in one of the strongman competitions. So I got curious and I started looking around and what did I find? He did win a strongman competition. It was called VegFest. That's right. He was the strongest vegan at that competition that day, meaning that amongst the weakest athletes, he was the strongest. Who says that vegans are skinny and can't lift paper? There was another woman they were touting as an Olympic great in the movie. She was a 400-meter runner from Australia. Morgan Mitchell is the two-time Australian 400-meter champion. Here comes Morgan Mitchell. Jamie, this is very, very fast. So I wanted to look into her and see how many gold medals she won. Well, she didn't. But that's not a big deal. Maybe she won a silver. So I looked into that. No, she wasn't even on the podium. Well, I was very interested to see maybe she was in fourth place. So I started looking into it. As it turns out, she finished 24th overall at the Olympic Games, behind 23 meat eaters. A lot of people had doubted me when I first became vegan, but my energy levels increased incredibly. 
and my iron, my B12, everything that people said would become deficient were amazing. One of the other people that was associated with this movie was the great Arnold Schwarzenegger. We all love Arnold. He was the governor. Arnold Schwarzenegger did some of the best movies of all time. I'm a big fan. And somehow in this movie, he miraculously became a vegan. I ate a lot of meat. I ate my 10, 15 eggs a day. And, uh, you know, I had my 250 grams of protein a day because I weighed 250 pounds. One and only Arnold Schwarzenegger. But as I got older and as I started reading up on it, I recognized the fact that you really don't have to get your protein from meat. And then in a YouTube video, right after the movie came out, he opened his fridge to show a ton of eggs. Not vegan, by the way. And he even said this. Do you cook it all? Yeah, of course. My favorite thing to cook is, of course, steak. Right. So, of course, the movie wants you to think Arnold's vegan, but he still eats eggs and steak. So I'm figuring if they got all of this wrong about the movie, could any of it be true? I wanted to figure out who made this movie. Where did this come from? Was it Eat Lancet? No, it wasn't. It was filmmaker James Cameron. And as it turns out, he made the whole movie to push his vegan propaganda product of pea protein. The output of the plant is three different products. It's pea protein concentrate, it is pea starch, and it's also pea fiber. In terms of the deal coming together, it was the Camerons, and it was really thanks to their networks that we were able to jump on this ingredient opportunity. From Verdient's perspective, the fact that we have the Camerons putting their money into this, and the fact that we have Ingredient, a global ingredients company that has come to the table too, I think that really proves that we have something here. This is something that's lasting. This will be a legacy for us, but we also see it as just the start of a, of a bigger vision for the development of, of food products and going all the way back to the source, uh, how it's grown, what the agricultural practices are, how to make that as sustainable as possible. James Cameron created and invested in North America's largest pea protein plant, Verdient Foods. It's not like there was any kind of conflict of interest there. And how to shift the world, how to move, move the needle toward uh, better ways of, of eating and, and better ways of, of growing. So I thought, wow, this is a win-win. I just cut out all the meat and dairy. I'm, I'm doing my thing for the environment and I'm doing my thing for, my, for myself and my own longevity. And as a father, I need to be around to protect my family, you know? So it, it, it just all added up. It was like, wow, where's the bad news in this story? There isn't any. Here's the crazy part about all of these fake meats. They're not really made from vegetables. They're made from monocultured crops. That's right, they're made from starches, fake proteins, and seed oils. By the way, we listed all the ingredients earlier, but there's something else you need to know. They're cheaply made in Chinese processing plants. And furthermore, Beyond Meat has partnered with companies like McDonald's, Pizza Hut, and Pepsi. What does that tell you? At one level, they're telling you these fast foods are bad, but then they fall right into bed with them. So you might say to yourself, well, maybe they're partnering with those companies to make those companies better to serve healthier foods. But we've already listed what's in Beyond Meat. It's not healthy for you. They're not doing you any favors. Listen, I get it. A lot of this makes me sound like a kook. But here's the deal. I don't have a problem with vegans. These are people who decided to do the right thing. Their good intentions have been stolen. I'm just trying to help them get it back. If you haven't gone vegan yet, I definitely recommend you do your research. Educate yourself. I did my research. Mistake number one, I didn't do any research. Educate yourself. I had been doing a lot of research, but I'm not going to kiss you because I don't want to kiss someone <laughs> who just ate meat. Here's the thing. This is a cult now. It's a religion. If you ever question a study or any number they put out in any way, it's heresy. Yes, it does include family members of mine who actually continue eating meat and dairy. They've watched Earthlings, they know the facts, they've been educated, but they choose to continue eating animal products. Whether they actually deserve to continue living. Can you imagine someone coming after you for what you eat? Does this sound normal? 
I mean, it's sort of like how Scientologists behave, to be honest. And you know what? When you die, you'll die alone and in pain and in the dark. Well, how about you? Don't get on my bad side, make some vegan gains, and be nice to animals or I'll kill you. You know, when you enter this world, it that's how you get in. Is You know, usually you meet somebody who's a vegan, they have a very compelling argument, and you decide to investigate it, and then you're all in. And once you're all in, it's really hard to get back out. Take a woman named Lear Keith, for example. Or who is she? Well, she was a staunch vegan for most of her life. The thing about being a vegan was that it, it wasn't what I ate. It became who I was. She went through her teen years. She went through her 20s. This woman was, was building gardens. She, you know, she became, she was immersed in the lifestyle but she started having problems. Veganism was supposed to cure everything. It wasn't supposed to make you sick and, you know, destroy your spine and wreck your reproductive organs and all the rest of it. And so I just, I never put two and two together, right? But as the years went by, you know, all my friends are vegan. My sister's vegan. Like we're all being vegans together. One by one, they start dropping out. You know, like the eight year mark, the 10 year mark, 12 years, my sister made it. So this goes on. I'm at the last holdout in my little, you know, my little group. Once she decided to try beef and she felt better instantly, the problems began. The vegan community came after her. As a matter of fact, Lyra Keith was on stage one day giving a talk and uh, there were a bunch of vegans in the audience. On brand for what happened, it was at an anarchist book fair, and Lear Keith got a pie thrown in her face. There's a video of it on YouTube, and you'd think it was a comedy bit by the comments, which we'll get to. To be quite honest with you, it looked funny to me the first time I saw it, until I learned that those pies were laced with cayenne pepper. You know, suddenly the world went black and there was blinding pain in my eyes. And I have to say that the worst moment of the assault was hearing people in the audience cheer. When you are in that world, it really is one part cult. There were clearly people there who knew what was coming. The audience was full of vegans and not one person stood up to help this woman. And if you look at the comments under the video on YouTube, you see what I truly hope are the fringes of society. I think most vegans are just trying to be healthy. They don't proselytize, they're just doing their thing. They think they're eating the best diet for them and they may very well be doing that. But then there's this whole other faction where it's, I would like to say it's almost militant, but it's militant. When you're slapping cayenne peppered pies into someone's face and going to restaurants and, and trying to overthrow the place. We love animals. We all love animals. We love Cecil the lion. This is not normal behavior for someone who believes that you should eat a certain way. My question is always, why is it so important to them? Because it feels like it's an assault to yourself. It doesn't just feel like, Oh, let me figure out this intellectual puzzle. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this piece of information will change something that I think. And that's a normal, healthy adult perspective on, on life, on you know how we should be in the world is we're reacting and we're learning and we're changing and we're challenging ourselves. But you can't do that from inside a fundamentalist mindset. And I think big companies are taking advantage of this. They see these zealots and they, they, they know that they can get these people to hock their wares for them. Take Unilever, for example. They're aiming right now for 1 billion euros in sales on plant-based products. And according to them, they want plant-based eating to be the new normal. These are their words. Can you imagine if even your church would do something like that? Or your local government? Or your school system? Think about that for a second. But they're making this the new normal. It's almost like a lullaby. They're trying to rock you to sleep on this whole thing and make it all sound perfectly normal. Dude, animals, bro. Like, well, I just don't I just don't understand the point. Why would you eat an animal when you could eat some chips? <laughs> like... This is not moving in the right direction. And here's the part you would never expect. A lot of this fake meat is being made by actual meat companies. They have to do this for their own survival. Even a company like Tyson, who we've all heard of, is investing in Beyond Meat. The largest meat companies in the world have also jumped on the bandwagon and launched their own plant-based meat products. In case you didn't know, 
Companies don't have hearts and souls like us mere mortals. They live on, and they never, ever let a good tragedy go to waste. The pandemic has radically changed the world as we know it. With everything falling apart, we can reshape the world in ways we couldn't before. And that's why so many are calling for a great reset. Remember we talked earlier about the great food transformation? Well, Time Magazine had a cover that stated the great reset. I mean, what is this reset we're hearing about? Where is that come? What are we resetting? Do we need resetting? Whether it's politicians, CEOs, academics, activists, or you, we're all about getting people together. Capitalism, as we know it, is dead. If we want to change where the focus of our recovery will go, then we need a new dashboard for the new economy. We have a window of time which is closing, and we need everybody who cares to get together and find solutions now. You heard her. Now or else. I don't know a lot about the Great Reset, but I somehow know too much about the Great Reset. The more I read, the more disturbing it gets, so you can Google it if you want your week ruined. Now is the historical moment, the time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system. There's this German guy named Klaus who started the World Economic Forum, and he says things like, We will now start a quite a high number of task forces to look at all the different issues. And a bunch of other people at the World Economic Forum are saying things like, We have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path. And then they post things like this. say things like this. It is imperative that we reimagine, rebuild, redesign, reinvigorate, and rebalance our world. Yuck. As we said, these multinational companies are coming together, and they're not trying to do anything except make money. They're not worried about you. They don't really care what you do. And we're OK as long as they're giving us what we want. If we don't stand for something, we're going to fall for nothing. And that's going to be a really big problem. Clearly, this is not just about food. If anything, it's about always thinking that new is better. And more importantly, it's about not being able to handle the speed of information. You know, you hear a lot going on when it comes to technology, right? People are always talking about AI. Well, think about it. AI is happening and you don't even know it. The best example I like to give is when I ask anyone today if they know any phone numbers. It seems like the average person from my small study of friends is that they may know two or three different phone numbers, but that's a lot. I'm 58 years old. When I was 10 or 12 years old, I probably had 30 or 40 phone numbers in my head. Folks, that's AI taking over, right? We don't have anything in our heads anymore of any value. They tell us what to do. They tell us what to think. Can it hear me right now? This will keep moving in that direction. You know, we see all of these sci-fi films that AI is going to take over and there's going to be some kind of robot and computer program and it's going to all just take over. It's us giving it up to this technology. We have all of the stimulation and all these things that make our lives easier and easier. We want everything instantaneous. And because of that, we're becoming weaker and weaker. So that allows something like a reset to slip right in and no one cares. It just happens. It becomes the new normal. The world's moving faster. It's a digital world moving at digital pace. Uh, and everything is moving faster. Ideas, people, goods, but not government. Uh, government just has to find a way to move faster and to address more of the real concerns of its citizens, uh, or there will be, I think, uh, an increasing backlash. I think what we've won is a reprieve. And I think, uh, therefore, the, rash, the, the, the notion of a reset uh, is more important than ever before. Don't get it wrong. This pertains to the food market, too. How does it pertain to the food market? The cost of red meat and other many other unhealthy things in our diet 
don't really include the cost of the consequences. Uh, so all of these levers need to be used. That does mean that the cost of some foods in particular would Thank go up. Sense. Eat Foundation has set, is, has set up and will continue to expand a mechanism for and uh, uh, analytic models for doing this on a national basis. If we don't realize that this is about power and money and not honest health debate, the day will come when it's too late. In the meantime, the useful idiots of the movement will continue to push this and it doesn't matter if they don't make sense. Take this London Real interview with our favorite doctor, Michael Greger, and you'll see how allergic to debate some people are when Real asks him about the carnivore diet. What's happening there with the carnivore diet? Uh, uh, so I just swear at it. That was my... <laughs> that was my uh, um, Look, I'm not advising anyone to just eat meat. But London Real struggles in this interview can be felt by anyone. It's a, it's a day you can get scurvy off of. Now that's it. I mean, okay, so you put a, a, so you put a little lime juice in there, and you can still keep rocking. <laughs> it um, goes against every. I mean, you know, there's right, just but consensus. Some people are living it. In the oh oh my God, some people are. <laughs> if if your if your if your counter is well, some people are doing it. That basically, <laughs> that can, you, you can defend anything. Now, the, right? But we have studies. That, let's see. Let's see what happens when you have people on a ketogenic diet for ten years. In reality, there's no randomized trial where we started uh, people off earlier in, in adult life and randomized some to red meat and some to a plant-based diet and followed them for 30 years. That kind of study will never be done. One diet, only one diet, ever proven reverse heart disease majority patients. That kind of study will never be done. That should be the starting point as far as I'm concerned. So let's agree for the moment that red meat, chicken, and any kind of animal is bad for you. And we all decide that a vegan diet is the way to go, except for one egg per week. Is that okay? Even just a single egg a week appeared to increase the odds of diabetes by 76%. Oh, fuck. You know, th this isn't an academic debate. This isn't an academic discussion. Who's right, who's wrong? It's uh, people are going to listen to these and actually hurt themselves, hurt their families. People are going to die. What's our number one cause of death, number two cause of death? Go down the list. These are largely diet-related diseases, and to tell people to eat these kind of diets that, 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 you know, it's not that it's not based on science. The science is the opposite. This is not the Dr. Greger diet versus the Dr. Atkins diet. It's the science. It's centuries of science versus the latest fad that someone wants to sell books over. I may be speaking for Dr. Greger here, but he had a chance to be in this movie. And guess what? He accepted. And then he came back and said no. Now, here's the interesting part. When we asked him, he says, he loves to be in all sorts of documentaries. Dr. Greger would love to participate in all interviews, but due to the volume of requests received, we have to factor in subscribers and reach. As a matter of fact, he wanted to know how big my audience was, and he had certain criteria for that. For example, if you have a YouTube channel or Instagram, how many subscribers, followers do you have? If this is a publication, what is the circulation? How many people will this interview potentially reach? Minimum 30,000 required. We not only met his criteria, we exceeded it. And then he came back and said he was too busy to be in this movie. Hi, thank you for reaching out again. I apologize, but Dr. Greger is not available for an interview due to his current research commitments. He is currently working on his next book. Thank you for reaching out to us. Stay well. So, we have to speak for him. Yeah, I'm cherry picking only the science that exists. People like Dr. Grieger are the reason that we need to stick to what we know to be correct. They are going to oppose me no matter what we say. Why do any more research? It doesn't matter what type of information you give them. It doesn't matter which type of studies you might do. They will oppose me no matter what. The science is here, the science has been here, but we cannot wait until society catches up to the science because it's a matter of life and death. They don't want to have a debate. This isn't an academic debate. I want to have a debate. I want you to know how to get healthy. You want to know how to get healthy? Cut out carbs, cut out sugars, cut out grains, eat more red meat, have dairy products, eat real butter. You don't want margarine, you don't want seed oils. You want to eat real fruit and vegetables. 
And guess what? Exercise is the fountain of youth. No one ever brings us into the picture. Some companies talk about it, but they're trying to sell you a gym membership. You just have to get up and move every day. The reason we have a metabolic problem in this country, the reason people are fatter than ever, is because we started eating processed junk. How do they want to fix it? With processed junk. The problem is, nothing is sexy about telling someone to eat meat, fish, and vegetables. It's too simple. So what do they do? They tell you you need something mixed up in a blender and put this powder in and have more of these pills and have those pills and we get sicker and fatter as a nation and as a world. I just want to say one more thing about Dr. Michael Greger. He's never seen one patient since his training. This isn't a conspiracy theory either. This is according to Greger himself by way of Dr. John McDougal. It's pretty uncomfortable to watch, but here it is. You could correct me on my facts here, but Dr. Greger, and my friend, by the way. Sure, your friend. For many years, uh, you started out in general medicine, but never really have seen many patients, have you? No, it was really just my postgraduate medical training. Yeah, I was never in clinical medicine for, um, uh, you know, uh, longer than that. I went directly to, uh, actually went, as soon as I got out, um, uh, I started traveling around speaking in medical schools, feeling that, you know, how many people can I treat in a day, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it was more important to train the trainers. And so went on the road and talked to other, uh, you know, uh, bu uh, you know uh, budding docs, um, yeah. hopes yeah. that they will carry on the torch. The whole plant-based lifestyle is also a search for identity also. It is a way to, to, have, uh, to, to belong somewhere. So you're looking for your fellow, your fellow plant-based brothers and sisters. Uh, you'll find a community, you'll find a story. There are lots of parallels between the 19th century and what's happening today. Um, in, in what it, way? Do it, you... it's, it, it's a bit of, I would say today we're facing a, a neo-Puritan time. It's, it's a time of shame, it's a time of guilt. And in a way, if you want to, to deal with that, you, you, can, you can do that. You can just buy of your sins by buying a burger. We all are against animal cruelty, but we pay people to mutilate, torture, and slaughter animals. And it's not for any necessity. It's not because we need to for our health. It's just because we like the way they taste. There's one thing we haven't talked about yet, and that's animal cruelty. There's a fact here, folks. For us to live, something has to die. Most vegans don't believe this. They feel that if you eat a complete vegan diet, that no sentient beings have to die. Well, that's just not true. I'm John Freeman from Dumas, Arkansas. I'm a farmer. I grow rice, soybeans, corn on a 2,500 acre family farm. These modern combines, they're GPS guided, so you don't have to turn the steering wheel. They're speed regulated to maximize the feed and the efficiency of the machine. And if you don't have a conscientious driver, it would, it's real easy to run an animal through the machine uh, if you're not paying attention. Take a combine, for instance, that's out in a wheat field or a corn field or what have you. It's killing a lot. And it's not just killing bugs. It's killing furry little animals. Everything from skunks to rabbits to field mice to rats. It's a dose of reality when you sit there and as you gather the crop, now they're flushed from their safe quarters and they have to go out and, uh, and find new habitat. But a, a conscientious driver, you know, can, can, uh, can help them out. But not all drivers are, are pay attention to that. This is all, by the way, ending up in your food source. In rice, for instance, uh, a frog would be separated at the time that that rice is milled. So as, as long as the, the frog stays whole, it will pass through the, the uh, separator. Uh, if the frog happens to come in apart in pieces, it's, it's very well ground up with the uh, grains of rice. You see, vegans are hypocrites. Haven't you heard that small animals sometimes die in the production of crops, and therefore you can't even be 100% vegan? Now it's true. Animals like caterpillars and worms do die in the production of crops, and we also can't guarantee that small mammals like mice and rats don't sometimes get killed as well. But the difference is that notion of intention and certainty. And so think about it this way. If you're driving down the road and you accidentally run over a dog, 
morally. That is not the same as if you were driving down the road, saw a dog, actively pursued them until you run them over. But the philosophy and ideology behind the argument that it's morally justifiable to buy animal products because sometimes small animals die in crop production adheres to the idea that morally speaking, accidentally hitting the dog is the same as intentionally hitting the dog. Amen. But that's not the worst. Did you know that for you to eat plants, snipers are involved? You know, some of the thermal hunting we do, you could very easily go out in a night and kill a thousand pounds of, of pigs. Uh, and, you know, it, it's a shame to say, but most of that goes to waste because nobody wants to knock on the door at two in the morning and, hey man, how about, how about a thousand pounds of pigs? So as an invasive species, we really don't have any other alternative. Uh, otherwise, they literally destroy hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of crop on just one farm. These snipers go out under the cover of night and shoot these defenseless animals and just throw them out. You don't believe me? You don't think I have video of this? Well, guess what? There's no free lunch. Three, two, one. <laughs> I want to end the animal holocaust that exists in the world every single day. If you continue to ignore it, you continue to pay for the slaughter of these innocent little creatures. For the same reason it's considered cowardly for a man to hit a woman, it's just as, if not more cowardly, to support the abuse and murder of animals. I always, I was always like, oh, they do it in a nice way, which is ironic because there's no nice way to kill someone who doesn't want to be killed. I'm sorry, I'm like close to crying because I can't get the images out of my head. <laughs>